what are the possibilities of an accident occurring, and what kind? Well, there's been 173 radioactive accidents across the country. 34 of those have happened in New Mexico. It may well be that uh, with all the transportation of all these uh, high-level waste and transuranic waste, we may be ending up with uh, Chernobyls uh, along the nuclear highways. <clears throat> because if there's any ever any spill of plutonium uh, of a uh, significant degree, it'll be so devastating that it'll, it'll render large parts of this country uninhabitable. I think we need to have more respect for our Mother Earth than to, than to force it to swallow this, this toxic excrement. Every time you produce bombs, you produce huge amounts of radioactive materials as wastes, which is leaking out into the air, into the soil, and into the water. The most precious thing we have is our water supply. If we contaminate our water supply, what is the, what is the meaning of national security? What happens when the government comes to your town or state and wants to put a nuclear waste dump there? We'll find out right now on Alternative Views. dawn on July 16, 1945, at the Alamogordo Army Air Base in New Mexico, a small band of military and civilian technicians waited nervously. In the control shack was Dr. J. R. Oppenheimer, who, assisted by Dr. I. Robbie and others, had directed the making of the bomb itself. The automatic control's got it now. Rob, this time the stakes are really high. It's going to work all right, Robert. And I'm sure we'll never be sorry for it. Minus five seconds. ultimate devastation which a war of atomic weapons could bring. And the United States is prepared to cooperate fully in eliminating, by world agreement and for all time, the nightmare of atomic war. But this was actually the beginning. We've come down a long road from the Trinity test and we have a long road ahead. Since the dawn of the atomic age, the world has experienced a steady buildup of nuclear arsenal. Consequently, there's a massive backlog of radioactive waste byproducts. The long ignored stockpiling of nuclear waste has resulted in a situation where products designed to protect us are now threatening our own health and safety. The United States alone is armed with 25,000 nuclear warheads. 17 facilities across the country are involved in the research, design, testing, and production of nuclear bombs. These facilities have accumulated approximately 300 million cubic feet of radioactive waste. Cleanup of these sites, where possible, could cost 100 million. 
At Hanford, Rocky Flats, Savannah River, and other weapons-making sites, citizens are suffering from DOE negligence and secrecy. In recent months, the Department of Energy has at least been trying to clean house and is now admitting its own gross mismanagement. States are closing their borders to hot trash as they come to grips with the nuclear waste dilemma. Well, it sounds like you got a bit of a revolt on your hands out west. Can you deal with it? Well, we hope to. Uh, we know that the governors in the West are very concerned about our difficulties. Uh, we don't want to have permanent storage in Idaho or Colorado, and we're working to open a facility that's been 10 years in the making in New Mexico, and we have a few months, more months to go on that. Well, if you only have a few more months to go, then everybody will be happy because I understand that Governor Romer says the site in Colorado will be full up in four months. Are you sure you can open that New Mexico facility in a few months' time? Well, we were targeted to open it up in, in October of, of this year. That has been about a goal for the past five years. Uh, we have some additional steps to take, some certifications and, and some planning that needs to be completed. But principally, we also need to get a, a form of, of transfer called legislative land withdrawal that we need to go to Congress for. Uh, Congress hasn't provided that yet, and we'll have to work with them as well. What happens if, uh, if New Mexico joins this uh, a, a regional revolt? Are they going to demand uh, uh, more safety standards than, uh, than they might have given all the publicity, Mr. Frank? Well, we need, we need to have that stored safely, and there must be a solution. If we don't have a solution for storage nu storing nuclear waste, we've got to stop producing them. That's all. Well, I've been led to believe by top security briefings by the Department of Energy with other governors that this is an essential part of the secure position of our national defense. Some of the low-level nuclear waste that is generated in manufacturing triggers for nuclear weapons needs to be deposited somewhere. The United States Department of Energy believes it does have a solution for unwieldy nuclear wastes piling up at DOE facilities. In the southeastern plains of New Mexico, WIP, or the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, nears completion after 10 years construction. Millions of years ago, the ocean left vast salt deposits here. 100 acres of connected caves have been carved into these ancient salt beds, one half mile underground. Here, military nuclear waste is destined to be sealed away for a minimum of 10,000 years. Since the Trinity test in 1945, DOE has designed, developed, tested, and produced nuclear weapons. A major byproduct of our defense industry is transuranic wastes, paper, cloth, metals, and other products contaminated with radiation. The radionuclides, such as plutonium, are heavier than uranium, thus transuranic. Nuclear waste will be traveling through 28 states, perhaps through your neighborhood, on its way to WIP. In communities along the nuclear corridor, concern is growing. Studios, KMX Radio Studios. We've got with us this morning uh, Joni Aarons and Carmen Ruiz uh, from Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety. We're going to talk about uh, the concerns of uh, Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety and also about uh, WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, and the proposed transportation of uh, nuclear waste uh, through the state of New Mexico to the WIP site in uh, Carlsbad. What is the information that you have in reference to the total nuclear waste that will be transported through the state of New Mexico? The Department of Energy predicts that there will be 1,450 shipments a year through New Mexico. I-25 will receive 1,000 shipments a year, which will be about three shipments a day past Las Vegas. Other waste will be coming from South Carolina and from Tennessee, Ohio, and Illinois on I-40. One of my major concerns is that there'll be an accident. It comes right down Main Street. It, it'll come all the way down Main Street, break off on Southeast Main, and in the process of its route, it goes within a block and a half of three elementary schools. The city of Roswell has passed an ordinance saying that the trucks will not be able to come through Roswell except between midnight and 6 a.m. DOE is already challenging that ordinance, saying that that ordinance won't be enforced. These particular routes that we're talking about are actually funded by the state and the federal government. They're considered state roads and federal highways. And so the city has some 
interest, obviously, but I don't think the city has 100% say as to what we can do within those areas. What if one of those trucks come by and uh, makes a, uh, you know, hits the bridge and, and one of those containers go into the river? It's not going to affect me. It's going to affect hundreds and thousands and millions of people down, down river because it's going to contaminate the water. It won't be usable anymore. The fish it won't be edible anymore. We have no evacuation plans, uh, no insurance policies available, essentially. Um, and that's what got me activated. I got so angry that uh, I decided to take uh, an ad out in the newspaper, a full-page ad trying to educate people that WIP was not down there. WIP was here first, coming right through town. I'm more concerned about these war as butane trucks that come through our city, the gasoline trucks, the sulfur trains. You know, if you want to worry, those things are more important to worry about than some gloves and some boots and some contaminated uh, uh, waste in a drum that's going to be in another container that's going to be sealed. I think they talk hats and gloves to keep the project low-keyed, to keep people uninvolved, to keep people unaware of what's going on. I think the scope of it's a lot larger. I don't think that they've informed them about the effects of plutonium. I came in very as a very active uh, conservative. I mean, I, I have a military background. I have a weapons background. I've worked in the weapons industry. Um, I think they always wanted us to think, they being the government, that we have no, no voice, no control, nothing we can do. Trust us. We're your federal government. Believe in us. It's what they told the people in Hanford. It's what they told the people in Savannah River, Fernald. They're telling us that in New Mexico. Uh, not acceptable again. Not acceptable. My problem with the DOE has always been their attitude from the beginning, which was there are certain things that are too sophisticated, too complicated for the public to understand. And I felt that there was no way that they could expect people to make reasonable decisions without knowing all the facts, and that if explained properly, Anybody, not just state government officials, but anybody could understand these issues. The problem I'm having is as a city official, I'm supposed to be interested in what happens in our community. I'm supposed to be knowledgeable and trying to make the best decisions for our people. How can I do that when I can't get two people to come up with the same answer? How can I do that when the information changes? How can it be all of a sudden that now we have something which is not transuretic, something which is more hostile, something which is more lethal, when we were told it was going to be transuretic? What are we going to have? Is it transuretic or is it not? Wastes that are going to be shipped to WIP are radioactive mixed waste. Now, radioactive mixed waste are defined as, as radioactive waste which through the process of their generation are also contaminated with hazardous waste as defined by EPA under Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And I think this issue of what's in the waste is a, is a classic example. I don't understand how it could happen that we could have gone through hundreds of pages of environmental documentation and all these years since 1980 when the final uh, environmental impact statement came out, which never said a word about mixed hazardous waste, how can it be that now for the first time we hear about the existence of the, ha of the hazardous waste mixed in with this transuranic waste and, uh, and the whole application of another federal statute which was never mentioned. There's no excuse for that happening now on the eve of when they want to start WIP operations. So my feeling is that this whole attitude that they started off with, which is if you knew what we knew but we can't tell you, uh, if, if, if that attitude is carried forward to today and I think jeopardizes the ability of, of the state and the federal government just to do its job and the whole democratic process that's, that lies behind that. If there was an accident uh, with one of these vehicles that's transporting uh, some of this nuclear waste, what type of material is being transported and uh, could it be an insignificant accident or could it be a serious accident? The trucks are going to be carrying plutonium contaminated materials in 55 gallon drums. Plutonium is the most toxic substance known to man. If one pound of plutonium was distributed across the world, every man, woman, and child would, could die as a result of it. This plutonium atom has a terrific amount of energy that it releases. 
although it uh, has uh, very little penetrating ability, once it gets against the membrane of the small passages in the lung, it could, a great likelihood, to cause cancer of the lung. Once in the lung, the plutonium lodges in the tissues. These yellow rays show tracks made by alpha rays emitted from a single particle of plutonium-239. This particle can penetrate more than 10,000 cells within its range. Plutonium itself actually causes most of its damage through inhalation, but it can also cause damage by being ingested, especially uh, if it's ingested with chlorinated water. Now they find that it does make its way through the lining of the bowel, then it does settle in bone, causing bone cancer and leukemia, or it can settle in uh, gonads in the, in the germplasm and uh, affect the uh, sperm or over and uh, cause uh, genetic effects. Transuranic waste or any radioactive waste or for any waste for that matter, if handled properly and, and handled with the respect that they require, it, are not something to fear. Right. The problem with these radionuclides is that they are dangerous for very long periods of time. Plutonium-239, for example, has a half-life of 24,000 years. That means it takes about 240,000 years before it decays to a level that would be considered not very dangerous. Well, it's true that, uh, that radioactive materials uh, last a long time, but they're also very easy to detect. And so if there would be an accident, you would merely scoop up the dirt around the site and package it away. Much of the waste is in solid form, such as clothing, dirt, or metal, which could be picked up and contained. Well, the maximum accident in the case of these nuclear leaks is very small. Uh, there's no potential for explosives, for explosion, and there's uh, very little likelihood that the material would move very far from the accident scene, so it could be cleaned up. We now know that 40% of the hazardous waste is combustible thus posing a more serious and immediate threat. Organic waste, 3%, and, and so on. I think the combustible waste is perhaps the most significant because even a layman can understand that when combustible waste is exposed to high levels of heat, there may be some effect inside the true pack and not just from uh, the exposure to the heat on the outside. Wind is a critical factor which must be considered. The worst case scenario would be if a fire occurs within a breach of a container. The wind could then carry plutonium particles through the atmosphere, traveling considerable distances. As we learn more, acceptable doses of radiation become smaller. Currently, five REMS is allowed for workers in nuclear plants, equivalent to 1,000 X-rays on bone marrow. Well, I think you can say that most scientists uh feel very strongly that uh, there is no uh, safe threshold for radiation. They go by what is called the linear no threshold theory, that uh, doses, uh, doses accumulate, the more dose you get, the, uh, the, more, the more health effects. The DOA claims people will not be exposed to harmful levels of radiation. The waste will be transported in specially designed true pack containers. We packed are surrounded by uh, three mini vaults, if you will, three uh, um, walls that are stainless steel, which includes uh, a 10 inch polyurethane hardcore foam that acts as a heat retardant and uh, energy absorber in case of impact. Um, and this outer layer basically protects that foam. The foam protects the inner layers inside. So you basically have mini vaults within this true pack. Uh, this is a formation, it does have. The container looks impressive, but it still needs to pass Nuclear Regulatory Commission testing. In one test, the container was dropped 30 feet onto a concrete slab. In this test, the outer shell sustained a puncture. The DOE claims such punctures will not endanger the contents. In a second test, the container sustained a further break. Some citizens feel that these tests are not difficult enough and do not reflect real-life scenarios. My concern about the true pack testing that I've read about is that in the true packs, as I understand it, has been some kind of powdered cement. Yet, in the latest DOE document, we find out there's going to be about 85% of, of the transuranic waste is going to be hazardous waste, or mixed with hazardous waste, including combustible materials and various other materials that are listed as hazardous materials under federal law. Therefore, when they're exposing the true pack to fire, 
uh, intense levels of heat to puncture tests, it would seem to me reasonable to at least simulate the kinds of waste that will be in there so that they have some validity to their tests. What are the possibilities of an accident occurring and what kind? Well, there's been 173 radioactive accidents across the country. 34 of those have happened in New Mexico. We do have some rationale because we've been shipping this waste from Rocky Flats in Colorado up to Idaho for, you know, for a very long period of time, 25 years or more. And we have had accidents, but there has never been a release. And uh, there has never been a release of radiation from a Type B container. It may well be that uh, with all the transportation of all these uh, high-level waste and transuranic waste, we may be ending up with uh, Chernobyls uh, along the nuclear highways. <clears throat> because if there's any, ever any spill of plutonium uh, of a uh, significant degree, it'll be so devastating that it'll, it'll render large parts of this country uninhabitable. If um, these trucks are going into our city, right, and something happens, who assumes responsibility for an accident? Well, your volunteer fire department or your fire department would respond. The state police are the ones that would take over the situation when they responded. One of my services would be first responder to the scene of an accident in, in, in this, at least in the city limits. Uh, it's to determine the, uh, whether or not there is any contamination as a, as a result and, and to attempt to form some initial opinion as to the uh, degree of that contamination. Carlsbad had recently upgraded their equipment with a hazmat truck. However, Tully said first responders would not necessarily have Geiger counters or even protective clothing. And the second concern was that they were telling, or at least uh, saying they were going to train the emergency preparedness people in the various communities along the whip route as to how to respond to an accident, and I didn't understand how they could even begin to train these people if they weren't able to tell these people what kind of materials they were dealing with. We've placed it into the responsibility of our fire department and they are now pre preparing the plan for what we should and can do in the event that a, a, a spill might occur. So to, to say that today we're ready, it would be not an accurate statement. I don't think we are ready. Since this interview, the Santa Fe Fire Department received two official DOE first responder kits containing one plastic sheet, two paper suits, rubber gloves, one half-face respirator, and a roll of duct tape. I know we are not equipped. We have no equipment whatsoever to handle any accident uh, that might occur. But uh, I'm sure that if there is any, uh, any funds available for any special kind of equipment, then I'm sure that we will be asking for, for assistance in funding this. The whip trail is routed through major populated areas across the nation. In Congress, monies were promised for New Mexico bypasses and road improvements. No funds have yet been appropriated. One citizen has taken his concerns to one of the busiest intersections in New Mexico. I was overwhelmed with the support that I felt from uh, passing drivers. Uh, in the form of them honking their horns, in the, in the form of them shouting out their window, thank you for doing what you're doing. And I realized that in some way, we as a community at that moment had been bottled up and we hadn't, been, we hadn't had the opportunity for a long time to express our feelings about, about the people's input about WHIP. Joni Ahrens took her concern door to door along the WHIP route. What if I drop it, Aubrey? Well, yeah, thanks. What I would like to do is take the signs and go along the routes and educate the people along the routes and let them know that the trucks are coming by and what hazards are potentially there. All of these issues that get raised when the government wants to bring plutonium contaminated waste on the roads. And it's all going to converge here in New Mexico. In Santa Fe, Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety, or CCNS, has grown into a powerful political lobby. There's no precedent for this kind of grassroots activism going against somebody as powerful as the DOE and the nuclear weapons industry and the defense contractors. 
We put $200 billion on defense contracts on hold when WIF didn't open. It's amazing. So now we have people all over the country. I think the most amazing thing about the organization and about the WIP issue is what it's done to the community. It's brought us together. We're learning how government works. We know how to write uh, uh, testimony for Congress. We know how to lobby our legislators. We know how to activate phone trees. We know how to raise money. We have to be very cautious, too, at this point, not to pat ourselves on the back because we have a long road ahead of us. Sasha Pyle took her concerns all the way to Washington, D.C., where she testified to two House subcommittees. Well, we know now that more calls and letters have been generated by the WIP issue than in any other issue in, in New Mexico history. And the calls and letters have gone to the people here and to the people in Washington, and they do make a big difference. After our first meeting, we didn't even know if we were going to have a second meeting. And then some other people joined, and then some other people called. And today, we're, we're literally in the thousands. In the biggest protest scene in Santa Fe's history, citizens from the northern part of the state expressed concerns about safety and future generations. To every woman and man who's worried for your children, welcome. Welcome to the bigger family. And to every New Mexico person who's worried about the contamination of this land, welcome. You're not struggling alone anymore. We have sadness, we have anger, we have a sense of frustration. These feelings are totally appropriate. They're healthy feelings. And in fact, they're essential because we can't have a political movement without our passion. We need our passion. We want safety. We want safety. We want safety. If it cannot be demonstrated that it's safe, it has to be shut down. Yes, and that level, we're a stop whip group. But only if it can be proven that it's not safe. There is little protest about WIP in the southern part of the state, where in the past people have had to depend economically on failing agriculture, potash mining, oil, and gas industries. The WIP has uh, done some good economically for us. I don't think that the federal government or any agency would uh, bring anything that would be unsafe for us, so we don't feel that it is that unsafe. Then the best salesman that we have is the guy that's working out there making thirty-five, forty thousand dollars that's got a job for the next 25 years with some security. He doesn't have to worry about the potash prices. He doesn't have to worry about oil and gas. He doesn't have to worry about a layoff, uh, something like that. And, and now they're talking, you know, there's enough waste out there for 75 years. So uh, once we get this thing open, I think you're going to see this thing just... Uh, uh, this really do uh, be a great tremendous impact to the state of New Mexico and to uh, Eddy County and the city of Carlsbad. I don't think it's helped the employment situation in this town. We went through two or three years of crisis time around here when WIP was at its peak. And a lot of people that did uh, welcome WIP did so with the thought that it would help the economy. New Mexico gets much more money back from Washington than it sends to Washington in the form of taxes. So that says in itself that government is big business in New Mexico. Clearly we have those people standing in opposition to a, to a number of people from the Carlsbad area who are saying, my job is dependent on whip. You know, or the people in the Grants area who said, my job used to depend on uranium mining and milling, and I'd like for that industry to come back. Okay, so we have these, this tug and pull back and forth between people at different ends uh, of uh, the spectrum in terms of uh, radioactive materials. Um, what I don't hear a tremendous amount from is the citizens who have lived here for multiple generations. That's where I'm not getting a great deal of input. When they work for a federal government, it's hard for them to speak against this pro speak against what the federal government is doing on Indian land or what it's doing to the people as a whole. They're afraid to lose their jobs. They depend on their jobs. So therefore, you don't find too, too many Native Americans going out and attacking the federal government. They are afraid. Well, my feeling on at least the Hispanic people is I've always seen the Hispanic people as a people of complacency. I don't know. They, they they don't object to very much of anything as far as their life is concerned. They're basically 
just living, surviving from day to day. The fight for Whip was picked just because of the kind of people that lived here. Just the fact that we are people that will not protest much and that uh, we take things as they come. You know, we are economically not too well, well off, most of us. And so it was picked just because of they weren't going to get that much slack. I've seen, though, that most recently my activities as being a minority twice as a woman and a Hispanic has brought out a lot of the elderly women in the Hispanic. It's, it's strange, but I think maybe it's that thing about women being more active than men. And they see the Hispanic tie, and they're coming out and asking little things like, what's going on, and maybe if there's anything I can do. So I have hope for for the people who usually lay low. I think they'll come around. It's just it's some... As the radioactive waste disposal issue reaches national proportions, small communities along the Whip highways need to be informed and involved. Our land is our heritage. The impending transportation of radioactive materials by our homes raises questions about our future. What exactly is in the barrels? What is the potential for accident? Will the true pack container safely contain the waste? Are we prepared to respond to an emergency? Is there sufficient and accurate public information? Is there independent scientific oversight? What effect does WIP have on our economy? What is the relationship between city, state, and federal government? Does the state have rights? Can citizens be more involved? Do we really have any decision-making power to affect our nuclear military industry? And the nation has three different tracks for solving the radioactive waste problem. High level, the transuranic waste going to WIP, and the low level program. All of those are controlled by the Department of Energy. WIP is the first one. WIP will set the model and the pace and the entire routine uh, by which the nation deals with its radioactive waste problems. I have personally been involved in directing the geotechnical studies and the research program which evaluates the WHIP region, the WHIP site itself, for its ability to safely isolate radioactive waste. I've, I've been involved for these 13 years and I've become convinced that the WHIP site is indeed uh, a very safe and satisfactory location, that salt itself is a very desirable medium uh, for this waste isolation. Well, which is beneficial in particular because it gives us a laboratory on the deposition of nuclear waste. It provides jobs in the southern part of the state, strengthens that economy, and it completes the cycle of the nuclear energy business that we've had in New Mexico, starting with the science at Los Alamos through uranium mining and refining on into the use of those energy fuels and now back into waste deposition. So it just completes a cycle that New Mexico is famous for. We know a lot about it and as a consequence we should be involved in it. can't solve the nation's radioactive waste problem for the next 200,000 years with a political solution. And WIP uh, was not determined to be the nation's radioactive waste dump because it was geologically the best site. It was determined because politically the leaders down there invited the federal government to come down to help them create some jobs. And then they had to create a framework around that to prove that WIP was in fact the best place to put it. And they haven't proved it yet because it's not geologically the best place. In 1956, the National Academy of Sciences recommended disposal of radioactive waste in deep geologic salt pits. The Academy stated that salt is plastic and that it creeps to fill in cracks. So any man-made openings or any natural fractures that might tend to occur in other rocks will be healed. Well, if you go back and look at that early report, 1956, you see that the recommendation was based on a belief that salt was dry and that it would remain dry. These attributes of salt, that it is dry, that salt creeps and heals possible breaches, that it is inexpensive and easy to mine, that it transmits heat well, 
all add up to make salt appear in 1956 to be a solution to our radioactive waste problems. In the early 1980s, however, conflicting scientific findings came to light. We now know today that a number of those positive attributes of salt are either not positive at all or this particular site doesn't have the positive characteristics. Uh, for example, the whip site is now clearly not dry. Uh, while there hasn't been enough water yet to dissolve the salt, there is water in the salt creating corrosive brine, which therefore would very quickly destroy any kind of metal containers that the waste was in, which means the waste would be in the salt very quickly. But to visitors at WIP, the site appears dry. It's nothing like I had pictured it. Uh, you can just barely see the, the buildup, and uh, it's dry, and I'm going to tell you, it's very dry down there. I, I would, the way I pictured it was that there was water running all over. Well, this isn't true. And people all the time visit WIP, and they want to see all this brine. We can't show them any, because it's coming in in such tiny quantities, it can't even be observed without doing extremely careful and detailed testing. Well, we say there's a lot of reasons why it's dry, and that is they're using fans right now to evaporate the water that is essentially seeping from the walls of the WIP project. Roger Anderson has done some calculations, and Sandia Laboratories has done some calculations on the amount of brine accumulation from the salt after the WIP project is closed. There's a range of numbers. If you take the lower range, then the problem doesn't look too bad. Sandia has chosen that lower range of values. If you take the mid to higher levels, then we have a site that is busting with water in 50 years to 100 years. And realized that we're dealing with a hazardous product, and I found other geologists that have been employed at the site that find this site to be absolutely a no-go situation because they claim it's going to leak at some point. If it leaks, it will get into my environment and into my water supply, and I find that to be something I don't think the Department of Energy is honestly looking at. EEG stands for the Environmental Evaluation Group, and our sole purpose is to evaluate the WIP project. Uh, some of the major accomplishments to date uh, include uh, the relocation of the repository a mile and a quarter to the south after the interception of a, a 17 million barrel brine reservoir. A mile from the center of the WIP site, a mile north of where the main shaft is at the WIP site, uh, there was a borehole drilled in November of 1981. The Department of Energy at the time felt there wasn't any brine there. Independent scientists felt that there was brine there and the purpose of drilling the hole was to see whether it was or not. So they drilled, they hit the brine, it literally spurted to the surface, and over a million gallons flowed out at the surface, creating a mini lake. New findings reveal a highly pressurized brine reservoir beneath the whip site. The Environmental Protection Agency realizes that people in the future, unaware of what is underground, might drill through such a slurry into the brine reservoir. This drill hole would flush radioactive materials to the aquifer above the site, or carry radioactivity directly to the surface, to what is known as the accessible environment. To address the aquifers first, we're very fortunate in that those so-called aquifers carry very little fluid. They flow very slowly. And our studies to date show us that if such a thing were to happen, a significant radioactivity would not reach the boundaries of the whip site within the 10,000 year regulatory period. But independent scientists think the danger is much more imminent. And it's also possible for the brine to come up and get into the aquifer and move through that, uh, move fairly rapidly. The travel time now is, is now known to be rapid in a matter of months or years. And then it would emerge in the Pecos River and get out into the biosphere. The Ressler Aquifer flows into the Pecos River from the WIP site. Uh, and the Pecos River downstream of Carlsbad at that point. So there it's not used for drinking water for Carlsbad, but it does flow into Texas and it is used both for drinking and irrigation and livestock watering downstream. We think that this new discovery or the awareness now that there is a brine reservoir underneath the site is probably enough so that the, the WIP site won't make the EPA standards. We feel, uh, I think, as a consensus that WIP should proceed, that there is nothing in these issues that should cause it to be terminated or even slowed.
WIP is presently exempt from meeting EPA standards because WIP is designed as a facility for research and development. WIP is exempt from NRC licensing. WIP is also exempt from the Hazardous Waste Act, and unless this act is amended, WIP shipments would be going to an unlicensed facility. And lastly, the state has no veto power. One of the things that, that I think it's important to understand is how this whole process got started. When I first, in 1981, went into the negotiating room with the DOE, their lawyers were there, and I pointed out to their lawyers and I said, well, there are problems with this consultation and cooperation agreement from the state's point of view. This needs to be modified, this needs to be modified, and I told them the ways in which the state needed to have its rights protected. At that point, the lawyer at the time for the DOE leaned over the table to me and said, no, you don't understand. We don't have any obligation to do these things for you. You either accept the agreement that we're offering you now, or we'll just go ahead and proceed. Period. In other words, they were basically saying to me, uh, we'll do this out of the goodness uh, of our heart. And I didn't believe that at the time. I still didn't believe that. This consultation and cooperation agreement is the only leverage the state of New Mexico has at present. New Mexico Representative Richardson sponsored a bill in Congress which requires that WIP meet EPA standards before the land is withdrawn from the Bureau of Land Management and given over to DOE's exclusive control. This is what the bill that I have does. It says that no waste can come in whatsoever unless all EPA standards are met. All of them. And they can't have experiments. The Senate version of the land withdrawal bill does allow for experiments. These experiments are controversial because they permit a percentage of waste to be placed at WIP without meeting EPA standards. The kind of information that we need has to do with how much gas will be generated from the waste itself as the organic materials in there, the coveralls and the booties and the rubber and the chem wipes, as this all disintegrates, it forms gas. And we need to know uh, the rate at which a gas is produced and the kinds of gas. Unfortunately, we're not satisfied with the experimental plan that DOE has provided to date. In fact, they, the plan uh, really only provides for one experiment to measure uh, different types of gas being generated from the different waste forms in, a, in an actual mining environment. Uh, there are some shortcomings in that they don't fully portray the actual waste that will be in place, namely to be pressurized, have backfill, um, and a number of other characteristics. I think that the whole idea of the 3% and the experiments is a ruse to get the waste into the WIP site without having to demonstrate compliance because quite frankly I think that the Department of Energy is worried that they might not be able to meet those EPA standards and rather than have to prove it in advance where we don't have the waste here and we have to start the search for a new site they'd rather get a certain amount of waste in there. They want 15%. We fought it down to 3%. We want to see 0%. If the bill does not pass by the spring of 1989, the Department of Energy may bypass Congress and take control of the land administratively. In the overall, the people of New Mexico want, want WIP to be proven safe. And I really firmly believe this. This is not a PR statement. I well, think that, that they have to let us attempt to prove it safe. Uh, it's, it's as easy as that. If we can't do that at the end of that period, then uh, all this is mute. All the demonstrations and uh, well, everything that we're else. Concerned about is and if they'll back off and let us get this thing open and give us five years of testing like we want to do and don't cut us back, I think we can prove that it work. And if it doesn't, take it back and put it in, uh, in uh, Rocky Flats or, or Los Alamos or wherever it came from. But I think we're on the right track and we've got a great program. To date, the Department of Energy has not published any plans in the event that they have to retrieve the waste. Would they return the waste to Idaho? Would they find another facility in New Mexico? Would they put the material in the first high-level waste repository? And if there are no alternatives, then uh, perhaps each drum should have uh, stenciled on the side of it to be returned to sender in five years if WIP proves unsuitable. There are many questions left unanswered. Citizens and public officials are pressing for accurate information. Well, the information has been very hard to come by, and the DOE uh, plays a particularly sophisticated shell game with figures and, uh, you know, how many shipments a day, for instance, what's in them, 
the definition of radioactive waste, uh, low level, high level, transuranic waste. The concern that people have is, is are people being totally candid? You know, um, the waste per whip is frequently characterized in the newspaper and elsewhere as low level waste. Well, it's, it's not low level. It's, it's, uh, a low level could be disposed on the surface uh, for about uh, two billion dollars less than we're going to be spending on this project to uh, put it 2,100 feet um, underground. Well, I don't think that, that the government presents all the truth. Most of the time we have to dig and dig and dig and, you know, 50, 20 years later, 30 years later, we find out the truth, the whole truth, you know. Alberta's mother, Viola, was a witness to the first above ground nuclear testing. And everybody thought it was a big earthquake. Everybody got out, the dish fell off the, the cupboards and the house se cortó por medio como se dice cracked cracked in half right. and it was hot but we didn't know it was an earthquake to us and then since then every, all our crops went dry our animals got sick and the sheep lost their wool the cows lost their skin and, and I keep thinking of all the things that had happened in that valley my God, it was that, and we didn't know a thing about it. Nobody in that valley knew a thing about it. They still, they still don't know. People are still left there, they still don't know that. And they're dying of cancer, my family is, my sister died of cancer, my daddy died of cancer, my cousin, two cousins died of cancer. The uh, personal opinion that I have of the Department of Energy is um, I don't trust what they say. They have, uh, when they get scientific information that shows there's a problem, they suppress it. If they can't suppress it, they criticize and ostracize the scientists that were bold enough to challenge them. They make a lot of promises, verbally and in writing, and don't keep them, whether they're legal agreements or otherwise. They haven't run any of the facilities that they're now operating across the country in a way that's prevented this massive contamination problem they find themselves with now, $200 billion worth of contamination problems. And alternatives have been identified to deep disposal, but the alternatives all have uh, other problems associated with them. Um, ocean disposal would be a violation of the London Convention. Uh, seabed disposal would cause problems if you wanted to retrieve at some future point. Uh, transmutation, although it can be done in the laboratory, is not a commercially expedient alternative. Um, sending it in a rocket to outer space would violate all of the concepts of contaminating and polluting space as well as raising the specter of an accident on the launch pad. Scientists have worked on waste disposal for a shorter length of time than on the overall nuclear industry. Waste disposal wasn't emphasized as much in the early days of the nuclear industry. And I believe now that the attention it's getting will result in very workable answers. And we'll have to continue seeking new answers and improved answers. There may never be an, an ultimate solution, but there is a good practical solution at any point in time. I don't think you can get to good solutions if your process is bad, and I don't think you can have a good process if, if the government isn't very candid about all the aspects of the project. If you are candid and you have an open mind and don't basically make decisions and, and do studies that justify decisions that were made years ago, I think you have a lot better chance in coming to a successful conclusion or a successful resolution to a problem. WIP is really not the solution to the waste problem. It's a bad site. The process has been bad. The public has been largely excluded. The state doesn't have veto rights. There's no independent technical oversight from NRC or other bodies. Whether this is the best site in the country, I've always refused to say we've got the best site. But certainly uh, of the other salt sites that were examined, uh, both for WIP in the 1970s, and for the civilian radioactive program when they were still interested in looking at salt sites. Uh, out of those potential sites, I think I can say we have the best site. In 1979, or whenever I submitted my report, I had concluded at that time that it was not an ideal place. The Delaware Basin had some problems, and one of these was a dissolution of salt and the occurrence of the brine reservoirs. And at that time, we weren't uh, aware 
of the brine seepage problem, but uh, compared to other geologic basins that contained salt, the Delaware Basin, on my list anyway, was down near the bottom. It is a mistake to go forward with a project that is not safe, that is unsound, that is leaking, that has water above and below it that we know is not going to solve the nation's permanent radioactive waste problem. It sets a bad precedent for the nation and the nation can't say we have solved the radioactive waste problem. All they can say is we've jammed it down the throats of New Mexicans and, and we can say we've solved the problem but they really haven't. Contamination is happening now, it's not in the future and we need to clean it up and more importantly we need to call attention to how lethal the byproducts of nuclear technology are and the only way to start public awareness towards shutting down that technology is to make people realize there is no safe way to dispose of it and it's killing us now. WIP is designed to hold less than one tenth of one percent of all the nation's nuclear waste. The 6.3 million cubic feet that would go into WIP is one thousandth of the nation's waste so that even if they do create this problem with WIP they're not creating a solution. They'd need 999 nine other whip sites so we still need to look at alternatives and second of all uh, I really don't believe that geologic repository is going to be the way I think we need to have more respect for our mother earth than to than to force it to swallow this this toxic excrement they have been digging on Indian reservation in Laguna for for uranium and now they want to bring it back to stick it on earth through this nuclear transportation through this whip program they're taking it out and bringing it back that can never be you cannot take uh, take mother earth out and make garbage out of it and stick it back it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way every time you produce bombs you produce huge amounts of radioactive materials as wastes which is leaking out into the air into the soil and into the water the most precious thing we have is our water supply. If we contaminate our water supply, what is the, what is the meaning of national security? An overriding question remains for every one of us. What is our responsibility and how far does it extend into the future? Well, I think when we're looking at the possible destruction of the natural and indigenous world within our own lifetimes we have to realize that we have a choice to make on a personal level that's going to affect the future of the world for hundreds of thousands of years we're dealing with a substance plutonium that is lethal for 250,000 years as technology increases and as knowledge increases uh, we can't hold those in the past responsible for what they did not know uh, and so maybe the future won't hold us responsible for what uh, we did not know. All we can do is the, is the best we can do. Nuclear waste is a crime against humanity, and uh, those that are uh, infecting us should be prosecuted. Well, there's a, uh, a regulatory uh, piece of guidance which addresses the question of how long into the future should we assume responsibility. The people who uh, struggled with this question when developing the EPA standard said that Perhaps 10,000 years is a reasonable period of time. I'm very far because I've got 30 grandkids and four great grandkids and more coming every day. So you can imagine, I feel awful. I feel awful. I feel real responsible, but I think that's why I say something. My family and I've got kids here and I've got grandchildren here and if I thought that project out there would endanger their health and their welfare in the future I'd be the first one to stop it but I think that uh, this town has a great future I think the state of New Mexico has a great that future. All the generations which will ever live on earth are here right now so whatever we do to the genes whatever we do to the to the uh, sperm and over of people will, be, will have its effect on future generations from now till forevermore so that uh, I'd like to leave the planet in the same shape it was when we found it when it was able to sustain life in, in a healthy way so that's forever if we misuse mother earth and if we've misused the sun and if we misuse anything else then it's gonna it's gonna come back on us and and what we look at in in, in the Indian belief and in the Indian traditional way of doing this is that not to misuse anything but only to ask for the goodness of whatever is there because there will always be birth. And I hope when that birth comes that 
they'll always they'll also see the light the sun will always be here and that the tree will always be here and the waters of the earth will be here where they can take them by the hand and drink this beautiful water like it was before where they can see their reflection of love in this water I hope for this for the future generation of the peoples here on earth us to the end of another Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We also can provide you with information on how to get documents by John Stockwell, the former CIA officer. We'd like to thank Penelope Place from Santa Fe, who let us use her wonderful documentary on Alternative Views. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.